I'm Carly Birch. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here at the Center for Sustainability. And you're going to be hearing a little bit about the project that I'm working on. Um, and so I'm a social scientist on the team and kind of joining a team of engineers and computer scientists building robots uh, for vineyards and orchards here in Ontario, New Zealand. And so um, as a social scientist, I don't really deal with patents a lot. And so when I entered these spaces, I started noticing all these things about intellectual property that I had not had to deal with before in my own academic life and doing interviews with a bunch of um, scientists who IP kept kind of coming up as this point of tension. And so I started wanting, uh, getting really curious. And so that's why I am now talking about um, the process of managing intellectual property in the context of transdisciplinary co-design. I am from the field of science and technology studies, um, so I am going to be talking about it in a way that is probably different from what you've heard prior to this point, um, although I would be interested to hear if other people are talking about it in this way. Um, but I'm co-authoring this paper and it's very much in the middle of the process. This is the first time I've put it all together, so please bear with me as I try to get these ideas across. Um, and I'm working with uh, Dr. Kathleen McGunn, Dr. Don Nathan, and my professor Ms. Lawrence Clerk um, at Bahanagan University. And there will be some theoretical maneuvers. You'll have to use your imagination a little, but I hope um, I'll bring you back down to uh, reality where you can see some examples of how I, I use theory to notice relations in different ways, maybe than then maybe people might be talking about it. So, so I'm working on the MaraTech project, which is funded by the New Zealand Ministry of Business Innovation and Employment, or MB. And the aims of the project are to produce technologies with AI capabilities that will address labor issues being faced by high value fruit industries. So we're working with the apple, wine, grape, and blueberry industries. We're creating a robot that can fully automate certain tasks on these different vineyards and orchards, and we're also creating human assist technologies. So virtual reality and augmented reality uh, technologies that can help to train workers or maybe even support workers as they're doing these different tasks on farms. And the team is using transdisciplinary co-design or collaborative design uh, to produce these industry relevant, socially desirable technologies. So we have six universities and research institutes, University of Auckland, Lincoln Ivory Tech, University of Waikato, University of Canterbury, University of Otago, we have plant and food research, we have agricultural consultants we're working with at Ag First, we have industry partners at all the three fruit industries and robotics um, manufacturers, we have farmers, and eventually we will have agricultural workers that we will be working with as well. And our team is the community technology adoption team based on the Center for Sustainability. So I'm um, working with Hugh Campbell, Professor Hugh Campbell, and then Dr. Catherine McGann was the lead of the project and she got a job with Bahanagan, so we're subcontracting her um, now. And then we have our two uh, postgraduate students, so Angela Ndaka and uh, Mira O'Connor. And so again, I kind of entered this project and the idea for our team is actually, um, our job is to study community technology adoption. And when I entered the project, I was really interested in studying co-design because I thought if we do the co-design and the collaboration well within the project, that will affect these, how these technologies are once they go out into the world. So there's the relations of production and the relations of use. And as a STS scholar, I think about both of them. Um, and so I started doing interviews with uh, team members, it was about 36 team members, and in all of those interviews, IP was kind of bubbling up as this kind of a niggly topic, um, this tension. And I started thinking really generally, so what is it? What are these relational things that are happening? So for co-design, we really need inclusion, but IP needs exclusion. And you know, co-design needs open communication, and IP really, there's an inability to share or discuss ideas, you have to protect them. Um, and then co-design requires real-time responsiveness and IP again needs this protection. So I was starting to notice these clashes really generally um, and I'm reading around um, and these issues are also being discussed in the field of responsible research and innovation, which is coming out of Europe. And if we think <coughs> of Mataranga here in New Zealand, 
RRI is kind of something similar that, you know, when you're um, trying to get money to do research, you have to be thinking about how you will do it responsibly, how you will do, these, um, do your science responsibly. So Von Schoenberg is one of uh, the founders of RRI, and he uh, defines it as, so he says, responsible research and innovation is a transparent interactive process by which societal actors and innovators become mutually responsive to each other with a view on the ethical acceptability, sustainability, and societal desirability of the innovation process and its marketable <coughs> products in order to allow a proper embedding of scientific and technological advances in our society. So for me, I'm thinking that RRI is really encouraging this re relational thinking in the science design pro and the technology design uh, process. So promoting more responsiveness between technology producers and the wider societal actors in order to produce relevant and socially desirable technologies. And they have these four dimensions that I think are really useful. So inclusion is talking about engaging different stakeholders in the early stages of the innovation process. Anticipation is attempting to understand how the current dynamics shape the future and actually participating in these collaborative processes around envisioning the future. Reflexivity is reflecting on values and beliefs held by different parties. Uh, during the innovation process, and then responsiveness is the ability to identify risks and respond to them within the science and innovation process. And in this particular paper, they point to IP um, as an obstacle. So they say intellectual property regimes close down innovation, and their solution is we need alternative intellectual property regimes, which sounds really great, but it's like, what does that actually look like in practice? So the basic problem I've come up with, so I'm trying to understand this, is there's a vast, vast literature on IP's capacity to cause disruptions within the relations of technology production, but also the relations of technology use and even beyond that. And I can get lost in there. So I am kind of noticing what people are saying. And at the same time, there's this general call for an alternative IP regime that's more compatible with the recommendations from responsible research and innovation, which some people are terming responsible IP. So these are IP decisions, schemes, and policies that are guided by RRI. It's promoting this mutual responsiveness between technology developers and societal actors. And there's a commitment to producing ethical and so socially desirable technologies. And I feel really encouraged. I think that these recommendations are encouraging. Um, but then again, there's a little discussion on what skillfully navigating IP-induced tensions might look like in practice particularly when working in transdisciplinary co-design uh, projects. And even the term collaboration I found is like, what does it actually mean? It could be collaboration between it, just industry and university or two universities. And so these words get thrown around differently, but what I'm talking about with transdisciplinary collaboration is institutions and people beyond. So the people producing the tech and the, the users, the possible end users and possibly beyond that. So the aims of this paper are to take a relational approach to IP and then to turn the focus from IP regimes, this big thing that's hard to put our fingers on, to more situated IP strategies and decision-making processes, and to explore how IP really affects responsiveness and shapes relations that are essential for transdisciplinary co-design to take place. And then also to discover ways to navigate these IP-induced tensions in practice. So for me, when I'm thinking about what I was noticing, what people were telling me about in the project, um, it's really trying to figure, a way, figure out a way to articulate these relational tensions that I'm noticing, but we don't really have words for it. People just say, oh, it's annoying. I don't know, it's a fine line, or all of these ways that people described it. It was like, but what, what is it? Um, and then how to actually address and anticipate these tensions in the middle of a co-design project. So I'm not waiting for everything to fall apart at the end, but trying to help uh, to notice what's going on so that we can steer things in a different direction. So to do this thinking, I turned to feminist science and technology studies, um, particularly the work of Karen Barad, who draws on quantum physics to help us think about how relations work in the world and particularly her work on responsibility. So it's a, a playful term that helps us to think a little differently about how relations work. Um, and so we can just think generally that responsibility is the ability to respond within situated relational entanglements. And when I'm saying entanglements, I'm talking about social and material things. 
um, humans and more than humans. So it could be humans interacting, humans and materials, humans and plants, humans and animals, all of these different entanglements, um, and that we're constantly responding to um, all of these within these relational entanglements. And these responses are always situated, they're always embodied, they're always entangled, they're always ongoing. Um, and the great thing about it is there's always a chance to do things differently. So she talks about all of these relations and it can be really complex, but then she also talks about how we need boundaries to, to live our lives and things. And she refers to them as a gentle cuts. And I will turn that into the word boundary just to make it simple. So we're talking about how we have all these relations and then there are divisions or boundaries within these relations, but they're not given. They're, they're made in practice. And so we can think that humans and more than humans participate in creating these boundaries. And I will bring to the floor that IP is actually an object that is creating boundaries within relations. Humans also do it too. Okay, to go one step deeper, um, responsibility. So we can say it's literally the ability to respond within these relations. It's the ability to respond in accordance with an aim or goal. And this might be where the idea of responsibility comes in or responsiveness is you, you want to, to do something and then you try to respond according to that. And their accountability comes into this because once you're able to notice these things, you can say, I am accountable. I can be answerable for my actions within these relations. Um, and then another step is an ability to consciously reconfigure one's actions. So again, back to responsibility and responsiveness. So it's just being aware of the actions that are taking place um, and thinking about how we want to respond um, instead of otherwise we just kind of are acting without consciousness of this. And it's not possible to be conscious all the time, but when we, there are tensions, these are points where maybe these kinds of consciousness or being aware and noticing is really important. And when we think deeper about boundaries, we can start to think, so what boundaries are being created? How do they affect our abilities to respond? Um, and then really thinking, you know, we can't actually be responsible, responsive or accountable if we're not able to respond. So if there's a boundary that's preventing a response, we have to notice that and then try to navigate it. And I think this is something that's important when it comes to IP. So then the question becomes, you know, how does IP and any boundaries it's creating shape our responsibilities within the transdisciplinary co-design project? Okay, so I should say, what am I actually talking about when I'm talking about IP? So in this particular project, um, I'm talking a lot about actually potential IP because the things emerge that could be IP, um, but we don't know yet. <laughs> uh, but something that is a potential IP would be something novel, clever, or unusual. It's also described as new or non-obvious. Uh, something that solves a market problem, something that brings benefit to Aotearoa New Zealand, to universities, to other, there should be somebody that can benefit from this. Um, and then this potential IP will become IP once it's protected through, and in our case, we focus mostly on patents, which would protect um, the invention's functionality. And so we think of hardware and software to maybe fit into that category. And then copyright would protect ideas or the expression of ideas. So writing software design fit into that. And then once IP is officially protected, the rights of the patent owner are then protected through legally enforceable intellectual. And so I'm kind of thinking that IP, we can start to see IP as this boundary producing object. Um, it requires boundaries in order to exist. It can't be turned from a potential IP into an IP without some kind of protection. Um, and then it produces boundaries as it enters different settings and relational entanglements. So I'll have some pictures <laughs> to diagram what I'm trying to think about. So we have this little potential IP, it has to be protected through some kind of boundary. And once all the processes go through and it's protected, it can go out into the world. But once it's out into the world, it's still actually recreating boundaries. So maybe they're not as strong uh, because there are different types of boundaries, but we have the developer or the owner of this protected IP, and then it's creating a new boundary between that person and the user or the customer. 
And these could be of people or organizations or other. And then, you know, being situated here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, I can't help but notice that, you know, IP is based on and reproduces Western conceptualizations of private property and ownership, which are not universal. Um, and in the literature, IP has re been referred to as the second enclosure of the commons. So the first enclosure being private property, um, and which historic it provides the foundations for modern capitalism as we know it and shapes wider societal relations and material reality. So thinking of intellectual property in a similar way that enclosing intellectual property also organizes social relations and material relations in particular ways. And Maori scholar Aroha Mead in 1996 wrote uh, a piece and argued that cultural and intellectual property rights represent a second wave of colonization because the prim principles that underpin Western legal perceptions of particularly intellectual property are seen as a continuation of the ideologies of foreign conquest and domination. And these discussions continue in the literature. And today um, I was looking at NB's website and there are current discussions about creating new legal frameworks to protect Tonga works and Matarando Māori before, uh, beyond dominant IP regimes. So there's a lot of discussions on what this might look like. And so I'm starting to think, so how might this boundary affect transdisciplinary co-design? Um, and could it lead to a priori exclusions or tensions? And in this case, I'm thinking, okay, we have the Western conceptualizations of property that IP are, um, enacting and uh, recreating. And then we have other ways of thinking about property and ownership. And there's maybe originally that boundary wasn't there because IP is happy to spread around and enclose everyone inside of their boundary. But we now have these discussions going on. So this is a really interesting place to keep watching. Um, but it is a boundary to be pay attention to. And but then we think, okay, going back to research um, in, you know, in collaborative ways, we can think, okay, like one collaboration could be universities maybe working with the industry or even universities working with each other. Each of them have their own IP regulations and rules. And in order to work together, a collaboration will require specific contracts and IP agreements. There will be negotiations of boundaries and creating new boundaries so that all of the different actors feel comfortable in this collaboration. Um, but then again, we have that set up between the technology developers and owners and the users and consumers. So the people producing the technology would be owning it. And then we have all these other people that might be using it. And there'd be a transfer of the technology with this nice boundary there. But my big question with transdisciplinary co-design is what happens when we collaborate beyond institutions? When's the the collaboration, the technology development is happening all together. Um, and it's a much more porous uh, boundary, a collaborative design project. People are moving in and out. It's hard to keep track of it all. So the questions become, how does IP and any boundaries it creates shape our responsiveness within the transdisciplinary co-design project? Or put differently, how does responsiveness take place when we have these boundaries to navigate? And so I go back to the Marotech project to kind of try to um, show you what I'm thinking about. So the data that I am um, using for this paper is from 2019 and ongoing from interviews uh, done by Catherine Mada and myself, um, interviews with 36 project team members. So we have engineers, computer scientists, agronomists, agricultural consultants, IP lawyers, administrators, uh, interviews with 39 farmers and six industry representatives from the three industries and participant observation. And I'm also participating in the collaboration. So it's an interesting space. So I, it's also my own experiences as this embedded embodied collaborator, which is where the feminist STS comes in. And so the method, I'm trying to create a method that helps me to do this articulation work um, and to, to explore what's going on and to address the tensions in practice. And so it's an extension of Lucy Suchman's uh, discussions of located accountability. And she's drawing directly on Donna Haraway's situated knowledges uh, piece in 1988. And so talking again about these relations of production and relations of use in technology design and talking about them in the way I have been talking about them, that they're 
the relational processes, including people and materials. And her big question was, who is doing what to whom here? And how do we, what is accountability in these spaces? Because usually it just, the technology process is like, okay, something is produced and we don't notice who's actually producing it and how, who, what, where, when. Um, so she's trying to get to that. But I actually weave Barad into this, so extending from just accountability to this responsibility idea, which takes on, you know, we have responsibility, responsiveness, and accountability can all be explored through that concept. So again, it's it's not only I'm kind of adding a what to take the IP. The IP is a boundary making um, object, so it's not only who but what is doing what to whom or what here. Um, and then also noticing boundaries that shape responsibilities, abilities to respond. So the question would be what responses are possible or not. And then also noticing opportunities to respond differently. So giving people a chance to notice what's going on and then make a, a pivot and a change. So how can we respond differently in this particular situation? And I am using really low stakes IP uh, tensions that have <clears throat> appeared in our project. And I'm able to talk about these things because they weren't actually patented <laughs> in any way. They're not really needing protection. And that's why I'm able to talk about them. But in the way that I think a lot of engineers, they don't publish on all the failures they make. I think the failures have a lot of lessons for us to learn from, especially if we're thinking about the bigger tech that we, we really might want to patent and how do we prevent huger problems from emerging. So the current idea for located responsibility is to locate the project, locate oneself within the project, locate the project's aims and accountabilities, both explicit and implicit, and then this articulate relational tensions, boundaries, and responsibilities. And in this particular paper, I'm focused on IP. So the question is, how does accountability to protect IP shape responsibilities to other project aims and accountabilities? And then the next step would be to try to address and anticipate tensions. Um, so in this case, reconfiguring responses to better align with the project aims, aims and accountabilities. Okay, so the first one, locate the project. It is taking place here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. I've already mentioned that there are multiple ways of thinking about knowledge and property that we need to uh, think about. And it is funded by the MB Endeavor Fund. So they're looking for excellence in science and team makeup, impacts with clear implementation pathways and benefits to Aotearoa, New Zealand. And the method for achieving this is through transdisciplinary co-design. And then locating myself within the project. So I made this nice course boundary with all of these different humans and more than humans relating together. Um, you can't really see in the corner, but here I am. I'm a social science scholar from the University of Otago. Um, there are other social science scholars from Intel and Bahamagan University that I are helping me to see what's going on inside. And um, so it's been really useful for me to have that. And yeah, we have farmers, we have farms, we have engineers, we have blueberry bushes, we have robot arms, we have all the universities, we have the industry partners. They're all kind of in your uh, ethics um, consent forms, all of these different things that we are part of how we, we make this uh, happen. Okay, and then what are our aims and accountabilities? So, I think these are ones that maybe a lot of people would think of with the project. So we have accountability to our funder. We're getting money. We have to do reporting. We have to give outputs and deliverables. There are deadlines and we have a reputation for future funding. This is something um, we care a lot about. There's also, we want to advance science um, and produce novel solutions. And I kind of put IP, IP is kind of all over this project, but it, it, it appears it could be an output um, it could be a novel solution. Um, another accountability is towards capacity building. So especially supporting the building of capacities of emerging scholars. IP could be in there too. If they had a patent, that would be really great for them. Um, we also have an accountability to producing and protecting IP. We have contracts. When I sign my contract, I have, a, I have to um, do this. I have to be supporting this process. Um, and then commercial relevance, we have co-funders from industry. We want to design technologies that are relevant and commercializable. And that could be an IP too. Maybe the, our fund, our partners, our industry partners want that IP so that they can commercialize different things. 
But the more maybe implicit aims and accountabilities, and I'll start from the bottom, is actually the collaboration itself, because if we don't have the collaboration, we can't really do any of this. Um, so it's collaboration amongst the team members, but it's also with industry farmers, agricultural workers, and within the design process. And then it's being responsive to their needs. And so we have you know, industry advisory panel meetings to try to um, attend to the needs of the industry partners. We have co-design workshops where we bring farmers in. We have interviews and different forms of field work we engage in. We'll have some usability studies. So these are all ways to keep um, the collaboration going and to keep that responsiveness moving um, in a fluid way. There's another more implicit accountability toward protecting well, for me, it's quite explicit as a social science scholar to protect uh, participant knowledge and data. Um, so to ethically protect knowledge and data shared by collaborators and research participants. So for me, it's inter interview data for um, people in engineering and computer scientists. It's the expertise that they are gathering and translating into these technologies. There's raw data. There's a lot of data that, um, and this is something we're still thinking through, but it's those are not actually protected through patents or IP, but they are a form of knowledge that are really important and fundamental to um, helping this project move forward. There's also people advancing careers, um, and then the project really cares about community technology adoption. So they want people to adopt these technologies in the future. So we have to be noticing barriers to adopt, adoption through responsiveness, um, being responsive to changing social and environmental contexts. So this responsiveness is a really big part of making sure we're doing the collaboration well, that we're creating technologies that are actually relevant, they mirror what is needed, and that people eventually want to adopt these. Okay, and then articulating the tensions. So this will be my attempts to do that. So we think potential IP literally comes out of all of these relations, but it actually can't come out there it will not turn into IP if it is shared with everyone openly. So only protected IP can be in this open space. <laughs> and instead, what I'm noticing is we have this boundary around, um, we have certain spaces where this potential IP can emerge and be discussed. And those are spaces that are protected by either contracts uh, or non-disclosure agreements. And in this project, um, it would be you know, among project team members, we can talk about these things or at the industry advisory panel meetings because the co-design workshops themselves are not protected by NDAs. So we have to only bring to those spaces things that are protected, not the potential. And so again, what I'm trying to show is that this creates a boundary within the collaboration which needs to be navigated carefully, especially because we, we depend a lot on the what the farmers uh, are sharing with us and those engagements. So I'm going to share the journey of two potential IPs in our project. One is a software and one is a hardware. And I will add one or maybe two more to the paper, but just for the sake of time. Um, so fast annotation is a software tool that supports the detection and annotation of objects. So in this case, Apple fruitlets. Um, and it was created by researchers working with the project. And so it emerged at an industry advisory panel meeting in this safe space, and there were discussions about what to do. And during those discussions, one of the major things was actually the collaboration, but it wasn't with the farmers, it was more with the team members. So we wanted a tool that all of the different people doing annotation could use. Um, and in this case, it would have allowed us to keep up with our outputs at a a good pace, and then also to keep the science moving um, in a way that you know everyone is using the same um, the same tools, and they can all work together and collaborate together. But for me, the collaboration was kind of the main piece. And again, we were having this discussion because we had uh, accountability to protecting IP and producing IP. So in the end, the decision was to actually open source the software. It went on to GitHub, got a general public license which is a copy left license uh, that provides complete source code as well as modifications. So the copyright was preserved, but they relinquished any rights, any patent rights. And if we think about this question, so how does accountability to protect IP shape responsibilities to other project aims or accountabilities? 
I think in this case, the boundary that was needed to protect IP did not actually disrupt the wider collaboration or interfere with any other project aims or accountabilities. Uh, and the collaboration, because the collaboration of concern was among the team members themselves and not really with the farmers. And so, and also the software, software is notoriously difficult to patent. So it was a pretty straightforward process. The decision could be made quickly. The team members could go on quickly and continue with their work. But hardware is a totally different story, as maybe people in the room would know. Um, and so this is an example of the Barracuda. It's a sick of tours uh, that are used to, it's a kind of a jagged Barracuda like uh, teeth blade um, to cut wine grape vines without cutting through the wire. So it was a great idea. Um, and it was created by a design engineer who works at the University of Waikato. And so again, the same day that the, the software came up, this one came up in the meeting at the industry advisory panel meeting. And it was kind of hitting all of the explicit accountability. So it was like, oh, great, a great output and deliverable. It was a novel solution. It's for a, you know, a young scholar rebuilding his capacity. Um, again, we're protecting IP, we care about IP, and it seemed really commercially relevant. Um, people were excited. I called him the superstar of the, the show because he was everyone was so excited by this. And so what he did was we got a provisional patent for it, I guess. Um, and I know. <laughs> and then he went on to keep innovating in this iterative fashion. So he went to the farmers. He was focusing on the collaboration and the responsiveness. He went to co-design workshops. He went to field work visits. He was making new little changes based on the, his uh, failures in the field. And then there, it got a little murky. It turned almost into a potential IP. Like we weren't sure if the provisional patent could actually cover the changes that had been made. So he, he didn't go back and forth and back and forth into the boundary as he maybe should have. And so in the end, he, it turned out the outcome was copyright and freedom to operate. So it wasn't actually patentable because it didn't hit all of the, you know, the new novel, clever, unusual after the lawyer did all of her um, amazing work looking into it. So there were other patents with a similar idea, even though the use and design were just, and design were distinct, but there was a piece of the um, description as to what went wrong or why it wasn't patented. And it was mentioned at the end that these iterated versions of the hardware were shared at a co-design meeting where attendees had not all signed NDAs and that could have threatened the patent um, had it fit the criteria. Luckily it didn't. So this was like a, oh well, but I noticed that part at the end as something that was um, really distinct and important to notice. So in this case, the accountability to, to protect IP was put in tension with the accountability to the collaboration, particularly keeping the responsiveness up with farmers. And the engineer continued to collaborate and innovate responsibly as uh, according to you know, the uh, accountability to the collaboration, but he, in doing so, he didn't really maintain the boundaries that were necessary to protect the potential IP as it was emerging. So hardware is a whole other story. It's really difficult to protect, especially in a collaborative engagement because as the inventor said, you can guess how the Barracuda works by looking at it. So it's easy to give away the hardware versus the software is a, a bit different. It's easier to kind of hide what's going on, what's patentable. Um, so in thinking about addressing and anticipating tensions going forward, this is all just in idea form still, but basically responsiveness needs to be prioritized if we want to produce technologies that are relevant to industry partners and the potential end users is kind of my argument in the paper. And that prioritizing responsiveness within the wider collaboration requires skillfully navigating the boundaries that are required to protect IP. Um, this is hard because not everyone knows about this and there's a knowledge gap <laughs> of the people that are just kind of getting into this space and the lawyer. And it's like, we put a lot, she has a lot of responsibility, but not a lot of time to be guiding us at every second. And so it, it gets really difficult. So what do we actually do? Um, 
I would, this is why I would love some feedback as well. So maybe we could extend the protected space through NDAs, ask all the farmers to sign them. And I know there's a lot of contention there and someone actually has to be responsible for that process as well. Um, constantly keeping in touch with the designated research office to keep the provisional patents and other FD related paperwork up to date. It'd be a lot of navigating in and out of that boundary, but recognizing the boundary. Open sourcing is one way that could be useful, but it is not a panacea, a perfect utopian answer. Including farmers uh, or co-design participants as inventors. I don't know what kind of processes, uh, what worms come out of what cans in that one. Um, maybe depending more on copyrights than patents. I don't know. I think these are all strategic in time, in real time decisions that have to be made, but it's good that we know what the options are. Um, and then just wider reflections. I think I've already covered a lot of these, but IP decisions are not a one time act. They're ongoing practices um, that really affect research relations and collaborations and potentially you know, the success or failure of a project and maybe affects if it's adopted or not in the future or if it's able to be made or not based on whatever IP issues come up. Um, accountability to protecting IP can require the creation of boundaries which can affect responsiveness. Uh, I think I've kind of said this over and over. So threatening research relationships, outcomes, and the relevance of technological outputs. And for me, I'm thinking real-time responsiveness will requiring this ongoing and cognizant responsibility. So noticing response, uh, abilities to respond and navigating boundaries skillfully and then centering the importance of responsiveness in the collaboration. So if we have a focus on, we need to be responsive, we can make decisions on what's going on and how we're gonna navigate it. And other things, the materiality of the possible IP matters. So does software get require less scrutiny? And what does that actually mean when we're focusing mostly on hardwares and there's a lot of other things going on under the surface? And the other question that comes up is, does all the attention to obtaining IP in the patents <coughs> actually obstruct our ability to notice and value other knowledges that are actually really essential to the innovation process? So knowledge and data coming from collaborators and research participants, which is another reason why, which is maybe less obvious because it's the more implicit side, but why prioritizing responsiveness is really important because it shows that we value all the knowledges and not only the ones that can make money um, for people. Uh, and then protecting um, IP and skillfully navigating its boundaries requires specialized legal knowledge. This is what I was saying, but it, it starts the discussions about power imbalances. So who actually holds the knowledge? Who has the ability to make these decisions? And so the knowledge or lack thereof can create these power dynamics. Um, and if you're not able to notice your responsibilities, you can't navigate it as well. Um, and, and I'm sure that the lawyer working on our team would love for us to all understand what she did, but she doesn't have the time to like, be in every space with us to teach us. And so this is, um, creates some difficulties. And bringing it back to responsible research and innovation, I think that these responsible IP decisions could provide everyday opportunities to practice the ethical and relational commitments of RRI, that it's not just some abstract thing, but these are actually just like thinking about responsiveness in your particular action. So it's an ongoing opportunity to reflect for researchers to reflect upon their own situatedness uh, within a project and the social and material outcomes of responses and decisions. And then there are also ongoing opportunities to respond to and anticipate disruptions to responsiveness in real time. And that to ensure that the technologies being designed are relevant and social. So, oh, and I'm happy to answer questions or to hear your feedback.